Rabinus Morris from Little Raven to Universal Scholar. Oh, Rabinus! Sounds a bit like a raven. Yes, and that's what it means. Little Black Raven was the nickname they gave him at school. I suspect he wasn't very impressed. Rabinus Morris. Streets and schools are named after him in Germany. So what kind of guy was this Rabban character? For the German city of Fulda, he is one of the most important figures in history. More important than Boniface? Let's just say he was equally important. The abbey in Fulda really took off again when Rabban was abbot in the 9th century. People came here especially to learn at his abbey school. Emperors, kings, bishops and other abbots sought his counsel. But he was also a controversial figure. Was he really the teacher of Germany? Some say yes, he certainly was. Others say no, that's going a bit too far. What is undisputed is that Rabban was an eminent personality in the Middle Ages and his vita, his life, is definitely worth a second look. His story begins in the year 788. It might sound strange to us today, but when he was eight years old, his parents gave him away. Just imagine, you're still so small and dependent on your parents, and suddenly they decide to give you away to strangers. Well, that's exactly what happened to the young Rabban. Goodbye. I want to be a good student and bring you all great honour. Farewell, Father. Right, I'm on my own now. May the Lord guide me. (laughs) It smells peculiar in here. So different to home. It smells of books and stone. Knowledge and herbs. Of sweat. Will I miss my mother? Oh, don't be a fool. Learning, discourse and the presence of my Lord await me here. It's the life my parents want for me. They will be cheered of heart now that they know I'm in the care of the Abbey. I was probably too precocious for them, too inquisitive. I must have been a worry to them. But I know they love me, don't they? Yes, Lord, I will follow you. I will follow obediently into the new life ahead. So how did Rabban cope with all this? Did he suffer? Well, reliable sources suggest that no, he didn't. Instead, they emphasised the young boy's thirst for knowledge. In the Middle Ages, this kind of ablatio or gift was not unusual. Children were entrusted to an abbey to ensure that they were provided for and given the right education. It is unclear what precise hopes moved Rabban's parents to take this step. They may have wanted to earn credits for their own salvation by entrusting one of their offspring to the church. But perhaps their son and his curiosity were simply too much for them. Or maybe they had discovered his special talents and were keen for him to develop them. Rabban was able to attend the popular court school run by the famous Alcuin, so his parents had no reason to be disappointed. The prospects for the boy's future were bright. Alcuin is a faithful servant of the Lord, an inspiration to so many. I will follow and learn from him. The new script he encourages us to write with will really make it possible to spread the Bible messages. It is now so easy for monks to put their thoughts down on paper. At the time, Alcuin was a kind of education minister for Charles the Great, who ruled as king of the Frankish state for 46 years and later became emperor. This kingdom extended over large swathes of central Europe. Charles realised that education was in dire straits in his kingdom. Monks who could write proper letters without making mistakes were few and far between. As king he introduced the major reform of education that became known as the Carolingian Renaissance, and Alcuin was his top advisor. Rabban's career can be described, very crudely, as a journey from being a nerd to being someone with a vast store of knowledge for the powerful to use. His hunger for knowledge made him a scholar, 
and when he became master or teacher at the Abbey School in Fulda, many students flocked there from the other abbeys. Later, distinguished individuals from all over the Frankish kingdom wrote letters seeking his advice, although not all of them expressed themselves in a way he approved of. Another letter. Look, he's asking me to strive for succinctness of explanation, summarising what you have found in the writings of those who have gone before. Be like what the bees would have done, gathering honey from the blossoms in beautiful spring meadows and transporting it to their hives, and fail not to bring us combs of aromatic honey. <sighs> how poor and plain this writing Yet how laborious the deed he asks me to undertake. The start of his career as abbot in 822 was nothing if not problematic, however. His first challenge was to deal with the pressing needs of the abbey in Fulda. It's all very well them asking me to take up my time writing back. But they obviously don't know what a serious state the abbey is in. Yes, my reputation is spreading. Yet I am but a humble servant of God, whose task is to lead an abbey, an abbey which has fallen on hard times. The monks face a severe lack of, of everything they need to live. So concerned am I for the Lord's flock that I have no time to read or to write. How gladly would I fulfil this request and follow my calling, but the situation is unutterably bad. The abbey must be repaired. Order must be restored. And the abbey school. Let us first feed the sheep, that the bees might fly again. How could the abbey in Fulda find itself in such a predicament? To find out, we must go back a few years to the time of Ratga, Raban's predecessor but one as abbot. Ratger had decided to launch a major project, the construction of a basilica, which was erected where Fulda Cathedral stands today. Together with its atrium, it was twice the size of the current building. The project devoured heaps and heaps of money, and to fund it, the abbot scrimped and saved wherever he could, neglecting the bodily, medical and spiritual care of his monks. On taking office, Rabban first had to clean up this mess. The abbey's reputation improved on his watch. Rabban's influence grew. For example, he was a frequent visitor at the imperial court. Exerting influence over others was an exclusive privilege in Rabban's day. Few people had access to the mighty and powerful. Scarcely anyone was able to reach large numbers of people with their thoughts. Well, things are very different today. Platforms such as YouTube, Instagram and TikTok make it relatively easy to influence all kinds of people about issues we feel are important. Rabban used books and writings to feed all of Europe with knowledge. During his time as abbot, countless manuscripts were duplicated and disseminated to the people. Was he perhaps something like a medieval Wikipedia? Where is it? Ah, here it is. No, that's the wrong one. I need Augustine later. Hieronymus must be here somewhere. Hilarius, Ambrosius. I need to answer so many questions from our brethren about their office, the many rules. They're always asking questions. So very many questions. Gregory, that's good. I've got to fit Gregory in. I gave one answer orally, but others in writing, following the pattern of the forefathers. But that was not enough. Not worthy of them. Ah, there you are, Hieronymus. They want to be able to read in context, in a single book. Things that have hitherto only been written out of context on loose scraps of paper. Loose scraps. Oh, Lord, help your servant. Now, 
Where did I put the venerable Augustine? Augustine! We must call witnesses. The composition principle is the only one which makes sense. I bring together the passages of our forefathers that I have found spread far and wide. I initial both their writings and my own humble sentiments so the brethren can immediately see which are the thoughts of our forefathers and what is born of my frailty. To write freely without referencing the perceptions of our forefathers is vanity. Pure vanity. Charles the Great's reform of education was already underway before Rabban arrived on the scene. Its goals? To multiply and disseminate knowledge throughout the kingdom. He also wanted to set uniform educational standards. Rabban advanced this reform. He is well known as an exponent of early rhetoric in Germany. After serving as abbot for about 20 years, Rabban had had enough. Today we'd probably say he was burnt out. A power struggle in the Frankish kingdom made him a nervous wreck. He stood down in 841 when he was 61 and retired to Petersburg near Fulda. This was probably a voluntary move, though we cannot be certain. Perhaps he was pushed into it. We don't know. Either way, he went through a personal crisis after withdrawing to Petersburg. I've never been particularly strong, but now I feel I'm far from what I once was. A serious illness has befallen me, such that I spend more time lying in bed than writing or reading at my desk. The scholar nevertheless regained his strength and became extremely prolific, writing numerous manuscripts in Petersburg. The high point of Rabban's career came a few years after his retirement. King Louis the German appointed him to succeed Otger as Archbishop of Mainz, following Otger's death in 847. Rabban was astonished. He had not expected to be made Archbishop at the age of 67. Rabban's comeback... Suddenly he was Archbishop of Mainz. Had he really been everybody's darling after all? Well, certainly there were those who had divergent opinions. Gottschalk of Saxony, one of Rabban's former pupils, travelled the country spreading different teachings. Gottschalk! Not him again. This sect has already dragged so many down into despair. He turns people away from those who preach the gospel. Gottschalk had come to the abbey in Fulda at the age of six and was still a schoolmaster during Rabban's tenure. Several years later, Gottschalk wanted to go his own way and leave the abbey. However, Rabban, with whom Gottschalk probably had close ties, would not let him go. After a couple more years, Gottschalk began spreading the doctrine of predestination Essentially, this suggested that God had already decided whether a child would be good or evil before it was born. Neither as a child nor as an adult would it ever have the chance to behave differently. By consequence, anyone who committed a crime would not be guilty of it because God had ordained it. According to this teaching, people can never change. They can only stay as they are predestined to be. Rabban saw serious threats to morality and social order as a result of people believing this. He had to stop this teaching. As if God would force people to be lost because of what he has decided already. What sacrilege. He claims the backing of Augustine, our brother Augustine. How could things get to this state? Gottschalk, my dear Gottschalk, why does he oppose me? What did I do wrong that he should tread this path? As a student he was short-tempered, yes, but inquisitive and so intelligent. He will bring division to all the people. 
The weak will despair. Why should I strive for my salvation and eternal life, they are saying. God is almighty, yes. But I still have to toil to enter his everlasting kingdom. God, Chalk, why did you provoke things to this state? A synod was convened a gathering of the bishops and representatives of the church. Gottschalk was summoned to a hearing and they probably didn't really listen to him. The verdict was harsh. Lifelong imprisonment in a dungeon and a vow of eternal silence. He had to burn his writings and he was flogged. He was dragged off half dead to an abbey cell. Gottschalk outlived Rabban but he died in his small prison, forgotten and crazed by the experience. We do not know why Rabban attacked Gottschalk with such anger and vitriol. Even during his lifetime, Rabban's harsh sentence drew much criticism and incomprehension. Although it was not unusual to exclude someone from an abbey for having a different opinion, it does seem that this time Rabban went too far. We know something about Rabban as a monk, an abbot, and an archbishop. But what was he like as a person? Did he have a hobby? Did he sometimes fall into a really foul mood? And what about his love of life? Lord, what is the matter with me? I do not know myself. I no longer find joy in the scriptures. It pains me. My spirit is ill at ease. My stomach gets tied up in knots. Only when I think of... Does my heart leap? Do I feel... happy? We have no evidence in this matter. We do not know whether Rabban was ever in love, whether there was a person by his side with whom he would have preferred to live a different life. There is little we can say about Rabban as a private person. He dodges the nosy attention of the biographer, as one expert put it. He left few personal notes or diaries, nor did he say much about others. If we had had Instagram back then, we would have known what he looked like, whether he was vegan, what music he had in his playlist and what he was like as a child. There is one saying of Rabban's which we do know of, and which suggests that he was perhaps given to a good long laugh. Let the children laugh copiously, else they be wicked in old age. Children who laugh a lot fight on the side of the angels. Rabban died on the 2nd of February, 856, and was buried at St Albans, an abbey in Mainz. His death was recorded without comment. Centuries later, his grave was virtually forgotten. There were plans to canonise him in 1515, which meant that his mortal remains had to be moved. But that is where the trail ends. No sign of his remains are left anywhere today. Not until the 17th century did Mainz recognise him as a saint, and the Church Universal did not follow suit until the year 2001. Rabban's fame can't be seen from his click rate. So how important was he in reality? Some deride him as a stodgy compiler, a copyist who never thought for himself. Others call him the teacher of Germany. Is it purely a matter of taste? Who's right, the Rabbanophiles or the doubters? One thing's for certain... The Abbey School and the practice of collecting manuscripts and writing were very close to Rabban's heart. Through these activities, he had a formative influence on many young men and played a major part in spreading the Carolingian educational reform, a milestone along the path to modern-day education. We don't know whether new insights into Rabban will be forthcoming. As things stand, there are no signs of any new sources of information about him. Science must therefore be satisfied with what it already has in its hands. 
things that have survived the centuries, information that someone once jotted down somewhere. Whether these notes reflect the truth or served some subjective interest, we cannot know. For that, we need scientists who can shed light on the context and put things in perspective. If anyone should ever feel inclined to canonise one of us in some distant future, the researchers will have a much easier time of it. After all, we all produce more data than ever before. Although, having said that, what we know about Raban and his teacher Alcuin comes from their correspondence on paper, whereas we communicate via floods of emails, via messenger services and social media. Will these messages still be around for historians to sift through? Well, that's something else we don't know. <laughs>